Reading from the New Living Translation, Mark 1, 29 to 42. After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to other towns as well and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. A man with leprosy came and knelt in front of Jesus, begging to be healed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said. Be healed. Instantly, the leprosy disappeared and the man was healed. Thank you, Rani, for that reading. If you've got a Bible, would you um, want to keep it open at that passage, Mark chapter 1, because we're going to be reflecting on that this morning. And we're continuing this series called Servant. And we've been looking at the last few weeks. What does it mean to be a servant? What was Jesus like as a servant? And Jesus said these words, that he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And I don't know how you feel about that statement, but it's mind-blowing, isn't it? that the king of kings said he wasn't here to be served, but he actually comes to serve us. And we want to look at what does that mean to to model that in our own lives? What does it mean to model that as a church? And the theme we're looking at this morning is compassion, servanthood through compassion. So before we continue, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to each one of us by your spirit something of what it means to follow your example of being servants, the type of servants that bring glory to you and change the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading this morning is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's moving from place to place and he's um, traveling around preaching the gospel and we see this series of encounters where Jesus demonstrates his compassion to others. And compassion is something that's really important to us here at St. Saviour's as a church. We want to be a church that's compassionate. It's one of the priorities of our diocese, London Diocese, to be a compassionate community. And I guess what we want to ask this morning, what we want to reflect on is what does it mean to be compassionate Christians or to be a compassionate community? When I was, um, first came to faith, I belonged to a church in central London. And I used to go to a service in the evening. And as I used to go into the church um, grounds, there used to be some homeless guys just outside of the street um, with a little plate with some money in it. And I used to make an effort of trying to make eye contact with them and just acknowledge them, showing them that they had value, saying hi to them every time I went to the service. And after a few months, one of the guys said, you know, you've been coming to this church for a few months now. You just walk past us and you say hi, but you don't do anything practically. You haven't put any money in my plate. So I kind of felt a little bit challenged about that. So the next time I went to the service, I stopped off at a cafe and I bought a cup of tea and I went there and I, and I said, um, here's a cup of tea, mate. And then I went into the service. And I felt a little bit smug with myself. 
you know, that I was being there and helping out and being, helping practically, not just saying hi to him. And then when I came out, he said, oh, you, oh, come over here. He said, um, he gave me a cup of tea, but he gave me no sugar whatsoever. And he said, and I know what shop you got it from. He said, next time, can I have a caramel macchiato, please? Not a cup of tea. So again, I sort of went away and feeling a little bit challenged. Maybe I didn't help him the way he wanted to be helped. So next time I went to church, I had to have a bag full of sugar in one hand, caramel macchiato, and I was made my, made my route to go straight to this guy, give him his sugar, give him his caramel macchiato, and I went into the service, again, feeling a bit smug of myself. And when I came out, I, I thought he was going to call me over and say, just thank you, thank you for your gift. And he called me over, and I was waiting for a bit of gratitude, and he said... Mate, I know you've only given me this because you want to get me in that building and just like try and convert me to Jesus, don't you? And I kind of walked away thinking, oh, I can't, can't, can't win here, can I? But I made me ask a question that challenged me a bit about why do we do the stuff we do? Is it so I can get this guy into the building? And if I was really honest with myself, that was the reason I wanted him to know Jesus. There wasn't really much compassion about it. I was trying to buy him a drink so I could get to know him, to drag him into church so he could find about Jesus. And these are sort of conversations we've been having as a church here about our own social transformation and ministry. You know, why do we do it? Is it just okay just to feed people? Do we want people to come to faith? Do we want to do both? How does it look like? What does compassion really look like? What does it mean to be a compassionate Christian? Do we need to make sure every person we give a cup of tea, that we also give a demonstration of the gospel? Or is it okay just to meet their needs? What do we need to do? And when we look at the way Jesus did this, we realize Jesus did both. He fed people that were hungry. He healed people that were sick. He told people about the kingdom of God and the Father's love. He set people free who were in bondage. And he says to you, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, go out and do the same as me. Go and do the same. But the thing is, Jesus' motivation was always compassion. That's the reason why he did it. It didn't flow out of some form of duty or some vision statement or mission action plan or smart objectives. The reason Jesus helped those in need was because of his heart of compassion and his heart of love. And I'd love to suggest to you this morning that when you look at the life of Jesus and we try and think about this thing about compassion, it's not actually about what we do. I mean, that's part of it. I mean, Jesus said, you know, the parable of the Samaritan, he had compassion. James speaks about in the New Testament, that faith without works is dead. So part of it is what we do. But when you look at the life of Jesus, what we realize is it's not about what you do. It's about your heart. Compassion isn't about what you do. Compassion is all about your heart. It's why the teachers of the law didn't get Jesus. They had a lack of compassion that blinded them to the things of God, blinded them to the things of the truth. Jesus would heal someone, and then rather than saying, that's amazing, let's celebrate that healing, they would say, ah, oh, but you know what? Yes, you healed someone, but you broke the rules. You healed them on the Sabbath. You broke the regulations. There's such a lack of compassion with the teachers of the law. And what we see is that compassion is this thing that releases blessing and transforms lives. And lack of compassion is the thing that can hinder God doing the things he wants to do in our community. Is so passionate about the rules that we miss out on the heart because it's all about the heart. So how do we do this? Well, there's two things from this passage which I just want to offer to you this morning. Things that can help you have the type of compassion that Jesus had, the type of compassion that transforms lives. The first thing is this. It's relationship. It's relational. It's all about a relationship. And Jesus prioritized his relationship with the Father. Reading from verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house, he went to a solitary place, and he prayed. And Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. And what I love about this is it's obvious Jesus is right in the crucible of ministry. He's right in the midst of a pressure cooker. It's relentless. The stuff going on all around him. Everyone wants him. Everyone has a need. And it's in the midst of this busyness that he seems to carve out time to meet with the Father. That's why Jesus could say he only does what the Father calls him to do. He only says what the Father tells him to say. There was this close-knit relationship with the Father. And, of course, the disciples didn't get it. They said, what are you doing praying? 
People are looking for you. People have a need. There's practical stuff that needs to be done. They didn't get it, and Jesus, in his grace, didn't correct them, and they just said, okay, let's move on. He knew what he needed to do to minister. And I guess he hoped over the course of the three and a half years he was with the disciples, they begin to learn this, that they couldn't do anything without the Father. They needed to remain in the vine. In the middle of the business, Jesus makes space to pray. Actually, the busier he is, the more he seems to pray. And the challenge, I think, for you and I is this, that if the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who was the Alpha right at the beginning and the Mega who will be at the end, if Jesus Christ himself needed to stop and pause and pray, how much more do we need to do this stuff? How much more? Why do we think we can get away with doing what Jesus couldn't get away with doing? Jesus could only operate with a close-knit relationship with the Father. Why do we think we can do this just in our own skill and ability and strength? The challenge is for you and I, if Jesus needs to do this, how much more do we need to stop and pray? Last week, I was in one of our local primary schools, and it was a wonderful time at the end of a sort of question and answer session with year sixes, and one of them asked me, he said, how often should I pray? How often should I pray? And I was thinking, well, that's such a good, idea, good question. I mean, how often should we pray? And I thought about it, and I said, well, you know what? If you just met someone and you wanted to get to know them, how often do you think you would want to meet with them? Once a month? Once every couple of months? Once a week? But the more you spend time with them, listening to them and speaking to them and sharing with them, the more you get to know them. That's how often we should pray as often as you need to get to know the Father intimately. How are you doing with spending time with God? How does that look like for you? You know, I'd love to encourage you that the most important thing that any of us could do is pray and spend time with God. And for you, maybe that's just prayer. Maybe it's reading a passage of Scripture. Maybe it's listening to some worship. But the most important thing we can do to be fueled for what we need to do is to spend time with God. We do that through prayer, Bible, and worship. But if you try and do this compassionate thing without God, sooner or later you're going to get burnt out. Sooner or later your heart will get hard and you'll find yourself judgmental. Sooner or later you'll just run out of steam and energy. We can't do this without God. We have to partner with God. When we were praying before the service, Sarah was leading worship today. It was just a reminder of, of that God gave his son so we can go in relationship with him. Our, our, our relationship with God is relational. It's not just following a set of rules. It's about a dynamic relationship we have with the Father. That's his invitation. That's his yearning for us. And he invites us, like Jesus, to spend time with him. That's how we're fueled, so we don't run empty. Jesus was full of compassion. And again and again we read that he responded to others out of compassion. But this compassion comes from an overflow of God's love within us. It happens when we prioritize our relationship. That's the first thing, relationship. Prioritize your relationship with God. The second thing about this compassion about our heart is willing. Jesus is always willing. There's this willingness. Jesus is always willing. Verse 40, I love this passage. A man with leprosy came to him and he begged him on his knees, if you are willing you can make me clean. And it says that Jesus was indignant. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand, he touched the man, and he said, I am willing, be clean. And I love Jesus' answer here. He was indignant. It means he was offended, he was insulted, he was in despair. He was in despair that this guy did not get it. He was offended. And when we see the heart of God through Jesus, if you want to know what God's like, the Father's like, Look at Jesus, look at the things he did, the things he said, the way he treated people. We see God when we look at Jesus. And if we're honest, I think many of us are like this leper as we go through life. You know, we see the brokenness of the world, maybe we look at our own experiences, our disappointments, our failures, and we know that Jesus can change situations, but we don't think he'll do it for us. We know Jesus can step into situations and problems and and we've seen him do it in other people. We know he can heal. We know he can give you that that peace, that joy. But if we're sort of honest, we think, I'm not sure he's going to do it for me. Not today. Because of the stuff I did or the stuff I thought or because I'm I'm not committed enough or we, we give loads of excuses. We don't think Jesus will do it for us. And if you ever doubt that God's for you, 
Remember verse 41. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. If you ever doubt that God's for you, remember verse 41. Jesus says, of course I will heal you. I am willing. He dies for us so that we can be forgiven. He's willing us to give his life on the cross. He dies for us so we can be in a relationship with the Father forever. Of course he's willing. He says, this is how much I love you. Think of verse 41. Think of the cross if you ever doubt that Jesus is for you. Whatever you're carrying this morning, whatever the situation, Jesus is willing. The outcome might not always look like the way we hoped, but Jesus is willing. He's always willing to meet us and to come into our situations. And if you've chosen to follow Jesus, he's always willing to heal and restore and have breakthroughs and have grace, whatever you need. Jesus is always willing. If you doubt him, look at verse 41. He was indignant. Why would you not think that I'm here to help, to support, to step into your situation, to bring peace and to bring joy? This is the heart of God. He's full of compassion and he's full of grace. And I just want to finish with this. When you're touched by the compassion of Jesus, when you're touched by him, it's not just for yourself. It's for others too. Jesus touches you. He's full of grace and mercy. He comes into our situation and he's willing. But it's not just for us. It's for others too. It's so you can bless others. We're, we're blessed to be a blessing, and that's why compassion totally transforms lives. Simon's mother-in-law is healed in a situation, and then she starts to wait on them and serve the disciples. The man carrying leprosy is healed, and he goes and witnesses and tells Jesus it's always to bring glory to God. It's always to go and make a difference to others. We have a, a wonderful food bank here, and some amazing volunteers and some wonderful clients. And it's so interesting that when you speak to a lot of our volunteers, they used to be clients. They came and they received and they were in need. And there's something about the compassion that they receive that moves them and transforms their lives. They don't get any money for it. They're volunteers. They don't get the names and lights. No one really knows what they do. But there's something about the compassion that they receive that transforms their lives. They want to give of their time, of their energy, to make themselves available. Many of them will say there's nothing special about them. It's not about their ability. It's always about your availability. You know that. God doesn't call us when we're perfect. And maybe they're the things we make excuses to stop serving him. But it's not about your ability. It's about us being available, our availability. And it's wonderful to see these people transformed. Compassion is about a relationship, prioritizing our relationship with God. And as we do that, then we begin to receive his heart in our heart. And it's knowing Jesus is always willing, is always willing to touch, to transform, but he does that so that we can be his hands, his feet in the world. Compassion transforms lives. As a community, we want to be a community that is compassionate. But it's not about the resources and whether we have an amazing kitchen or youth space or whether we're trained or whether we go in this course and that course. It starts with the heart. It's an overflow of the heart. And as we allow God to minister and change our hearts, then the response of that is that we want to be compassionate. We want to step out. We want to give and surrender and be generous and help those in need. That's what God calls us to do. He touches you so that you can be blessed, but that you can go on and touch others. And that's when we see our community transformed. If you're able, would you like to stand? If the band would like to, to come up. Something wonderful about this passage of, of just the willingness of Jesus, it's almost he wants to make it so clear that he's always willing. He's always willing to step into our situations. But then the, the response of those that he touches, their response is to go and be compassionate to others. And I wonder what that looks like for you this morning. What does it look like for you to make space? What does it look like for you to, to believe that God is for you? What does it look like for you to be available, to be used by God, to make a difference to others? 
We're going to invite the Spirit of the Lord to come. And Holy Spirit, we do. We just ask that you'd come, that you'd come and fill us and minister to our hearts. We don't just want to go through this this faith as, as a duty. But when people challenge us, we want to say we do it because we love you. The same way as our Father loves us. God so loved the world he gave us Jesus and he calls us to love each other spirit of the living God we pray that you would come and that you would minister to our hearts today where our hearts need to be softened would you come and just melt them where we're burned out and we've given out so much and we've tried to do it in our own strength, would you come and restore and fill and revive us? And just allow him to just minister to your hearts now, just in the silence, just allow him to come by his spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And God longs to speak to us and maybe he's just speaking to your heart this morning about something about compassion. He's, I feel there's a, there's a few people here that God just wants to say, I'm, I'm for you. I'm for you. Yes, I'm for others and you, you know he's for others and you know he can, he's able. But he's saying, I'm able for you. That thing which you're carrying, invite me into that situation. Jesus is for you. Just receive from him. Receive what he's saying to you this morning. And the other thing I think God might be wanting to say to someone here this morning is just how much we need him. He's for us, but we have to invite him into our lives. We we need him. And and maybe you've been trying to do this thing of life or a situation or a problem in your own strength. And you're tired. And you're weary. Or maybe you're disappointed. The picture I got before the service was of um, two Lego cars. One of them was one of those pullback cars. You put it back and it just goes by itself. And I've got a sense that maybe that's some of us this morning. We, we feel that God's filled us and then we just go off and try and do things in our own strength. And then the other picture I got was, was, was a child playing with a car, constantly having his hand on it, pushing it, directing it, guiding it. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to partner with us. He's not just there to wind us up and to let us loose, but to, to be with us, to carry us and... For us to rely on his strength. We could do all things in his strength. Not in our strength. In his strength. And maybe this morning God's just asking you, rely on me. Let me take the weight. the Lord's speaking to you, just allow him to continue to speak to you. We're going to move into a time of worship and if you like prayer for any of those things or anything else you think the Lord might be saying to you this morning, then a few of us will be at the back, we'll be willing to pray for you, just just come and make a way to find us and um, we'd love to pray for you and bless you this morning. But now let's just move into a time of worship. <laughs>